Hello again. We're now moving from romanticism towards realism. So a few examples at the beginning may um, give you a sense of how the styles overlap a little bit, but the most important thing to be aware of is that with the system of the art academies and salon that we had seen throughout uh, Western Europe, really dating back as far as the mid-baroque through the rococo we had this movement toward a system of art making in which there were pretty steady fast rules um, for instance that history painting was the apex the most important of the hierarchy of types of paintings um, genre scenes were considered less important still life less important the idea of training people to do art in a specific way and that the backbone of that training needed to be steeped in studying the classics, studying Greece and Rome and building on the art of the Renaissance sort of had made art into a, a system, if you will, system of training, system of electing who would be given membership into the academy, the side that's judging the work that's being produced. So plenty of artists were looking for ways to um, change or challenge that system. Strangely enough, it makes sense to me that the neoclassical style would be accepted by the academies. The romantic style was for some people's taste a little bit too dramatic, but it still relied pretty heavily on the use of the canon of proportions that comes to us from ancient Greece, uh, Rome, through the Renaissance. So the quality and the the type of approach to making these history paintings the most important thing that you could possibly ever want to do was pretty strong in both neoclassical and romantic styles. So they existed at the same time and people could kind of choose between them. And we saw a couple examples of artists whose styles overlapped or they went a little bit back and forth between those two styles. So really the late 1700s for neoclassical into the early 18s for romantic, the style really is the early half of the 1800s. But by mid-century, there were plenty of artists who were looking to do something new and different. And they really did kind of challenge what the salon system um, said art could be about. And that brings us to the style realism. Courbet is by far the most important name on this list. He is the first person to refer to his style as realism with a capital R as a proper noun. I generally try not to call things realistic uh, with a lowercase r because it sounds like I'm implying the capital R proper noun realism of Courbet's style mid-century in France and how it spills out from there. So generally I try to refer to things as either abstract or naturalistic. When we talk about realism with a capital R, we really are talking about this mid 1800s uh, style that moves away from and opposes or is even uh, kind of a revolution to what the romantics and neoclassicists are doing. The realist style is gonna give birth to the things that you love, I promise. When you see realism, remember that it's like the the grandfather of the styles of impressionism and post-impressionism things that are very much steeped in everyday life and in the real world so let's take a look at some other examples of the work this is the work of the painter corot and corot was an artist who did landscapes out of doors and he's one of the first people to do this so he really is truly painting from direct observation so the more that he uh, approaches this type of of way of thinking about painting that painting is not about doing history painting it's not about subjects that are um, important historical battles or scenes from the bible he is giving us a view of daily life in a way that few artists before him had really been able to achieve so Corot kind of steps outside of the mainstream and he becomes a bit of a cult figure to a group of painters who establish themselves in a bit of an art colony outside of Paris in a town called Barbizon that brings us to the Barbizon school again think of it 
like a school of thought or a school of fish. It's a group of like-minded or similar people. Um, Carreau was kind of their um, hero figure, but the main leader really of the Barber School is Rousseau. And here you see an example of Rousseau's work from his time in Barbesson. Uh, they literally painted humble places, everyday life, outdoors, in um, direct observation. They're setting the stage for what the Impressionists are going to do. So Rousseau is someone who um, is fundamentally about making art on his own terms and making art do something that it hasn't done before. He was able to gain some control of the French Salon after the revolution ended. And so he was able to introduce a little bit more um, acceptance for people who went outside of the norm. And so the Barbizon painters were able to gain a little tiny foothold in the salon system. One of the more famous names really to come out of Barbizon is Millet. And Millet was a remarkable painter in terms of his natural ability, but also in the fact that he came from a humble background. He's not an artist as the son of an already established artist. In fact, he comes from a very humble background, a rural farm family. And the people of his village actually got together and provided um, a pool of money to provide him with money to go to the art academy. So he was really supported by his community. And to sort of pay homage back to them, he produces images like this that show the dignity and the power of the worker. And in this case, the female farm worker, really kind of uh, giving us a chance to see the dignity and the hard work that goes into supporting the upper classes. It shows the um, humanity of people who might otherwise have been overlooked, and we can't really say enough good things about Millet. His work was influential not only at the time that he was creating the work, but in the next generation. Van Gogh absolutely adored what Millet was doing and in fact made his own versions. I wouldn't even call these copies because they're so changed from the original source, but quite clearly by the title, he refers to these as uh, after Millet as a title name. You see him taking these subjects into new and slightly different directions. This is perhaps the most intensely colored of his images of the sower um, based on what Millet was doing. We're going to go from realism, from this approach of showing the real world the way it really is, to a form of expressionism, giving us um, a sense of how abstraction and intensifying color and emotion can create a different feeling through a familiar uh, symbol like the sower. We also want to take a look at the Crystal Palace. Now, this was a building that was built to house an exhibition. The consort, the husband of Queen Victoria, he was never king, Prince Albert, had this idea to have a world's fair, if you will. It was an opportunity to bring together the um, leaders of industry, people who were manufacturing new goods in new ways, um, to kind of showcase England being at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. So when they were in the planning stages and realizing how many vendors were going to be showing work and they decided to invite people from other countries, it became almost a worldwide phenomenon. It was clear that there was no space big enough in London to house this event. And so a competition was held to see uh, what design ideas people could come up with for a new exhibition space. So Joseph Paxton, who had up until this time really only done architecture in terms of designing and building greenhouses for growing plants. Um, they were generally made of cast iron and sheets of glass. He devised this design for a new structure, a building that would be newly constructed uh, to house this massive, massive exhibition. So the uh, exhibition was called The Works of Industry of All Nations. Joseph Paxton is the designer. The building was nicknamed the Crystal Palace. The exhibition is sometimes referred to as the Great Exhibition of 1851 um, or the Works of Industry of All Nations. It was a remarkable 
uh, event. This is a colorized, hand-colored print that shows you what the interior of that space looks like. It's kind of like a shopping mall, isn't it? Big spaces where people could show the latest artwork, designs, um, objects of industry, things from all kinds of different manufacturing firms. If you added up all of the display space, it covered 18 acres, more than eight miles of display surface for 14,000 exhibitors. There were 560 exhibits from the U.S. alone. Uh, this building was built on site, and you see a tree there in the colorized version. They literally built the building around pre-existing trees so they didn't have to tear it down. After the exhibition ended, the building stayed there for a while. Then they decided to dismantle it and move it and uh, allow it to be used for other purposes. It was a, a, um, generally feared that the uh, building might be a target during the First World War. Um, in fact, it was burned by fire in 1936. The remains of it were completely demolished out of fear that it would become a target again in the Second World War. Here's the original sketches kind of suggesting how the building would be made. It was built out of cast iron pieces that could be mass produced in a factory. So what we would refer to as prefabricated, the parts were already made, delivered to the site and then assembled there, which allowed the building to go up in a matter of months rather than a series of years. Buildings this large, it's bigger than most cathedrals, buildings this large used to take years upon years to build, and instead this building went up in a matter of months. There's a photograph of the installation with the tree at the transept, pretty incredible achievement in engineering. These are some of the examples of the things that America sent, including the Colt repeating pistol. But we also premiered a ton of things that we still use in our actual day-to-day -day lives. Microscopes, surgical instruments, uh, false teeth, artificial teeth. Uh, Goodyear Rubber Company premiered of their Goodyear rubber tires there. Uh, the Colt repeating pistol, as I said, all kinds of things from industry, but also works of art, including Hiram Power's Greek slave that we looked at uh, in the previous section on romantic artwork in America. This shows you the grounds of the display space. They had to design a new uh, form of transport to bring people to the site. There were side industries that grew up, vendors who would sell food. People would buy tickets and spend the entire day at this exhibition space and still, even on return visits, would not be able to see everything that was displayed. That gives you a sense of the space itself, how vast it really was. This is a shot that shows you the uh, repositioned uh, building before it was completely destroyed. Once it was removed to a second location, it's kind of amazing to think that this Palace Park was home to a multitude of different industries. Uh, the building itself was partially used as TV studios. It was used for cricket uh, grounds. It was used for football, what Americans would call soccer. Uh, it even at one point had a racetrack at it. So racetrack uh, racing ended at the Crystal Park uh, in 1972, which is kind of interesting to think about it. It's still existing into almost your lifetimes. The artist Gustav Courbet is really a, a good transition here from this looking at the Industrial Revolution to thinking about what art can now do in the age of the machine. So Courbet is um, the leader of realism. He is the first person to use the term realism with a capital R uh, as a proper noun, as a name for a style or a movement, group of artists. And Courbet very much painted what the real world looked like, the way he really saw it, with almost eerie, photographically realistic detail. But he's painting something that we really haven't seen outside of some genre scenes in uh, the Baroque and the Renaissance, maybe a, a little bit in the Northern Renaissance, we saw some images of more humble people, but now front and center, we have daily life of everyday people. And that's what Courbet is painting here. These men are 
breaking stone and laying the gravel to create a road. So these are the stone breakers. They are little, literally paving the way to the future, but it's backbreaking labor. You can see that it is not a highly paid profession. You can see the wear and tear on their clothing um, and even on their bodies. So what is happening with Courbet is, is kind of fascinating. His artwork is accepted in the salon because of the quality of the drawing and the painting. It clearly is a masterwork, but at the same time, people are very confused as to why this kind of subject would be allowed. As we start to see with the Barbizon landscape and now these images of humble people, we're really starting to introduce subjects to the salon culture other than paintings that would fit nicely into the category of history painting. So it really does start to uh, break down what that uh, old system was all about. This is a Courbet piece that ironically was rejected for an exhibition that the French put together as kind of an answer to the great exhibition of 1851 in London. The Exposition Universale in 1855 was a a French attempt to hold a World's Fair, similar to what the British had done in 51, and they generally accepted only the types of work that were more commonly acceptable to the uh, Salon and to the Academy. They accepted work by neoclassical artists, they accepted work by Romantic artists, but they generally rejected the work of artists who were calling themselves realists. So Courbet when this piece was rejected, said, all right, fine, I'll set up my own separate exhibition space. So he set up a separate, what he called pavilion of realism to showcase the work that he was doing that showed the real world the way it really was. So that's a kind of remarkable way of reacting against the um, powers that be. I love these quotes from him. These are ones that that I think about quite a lot when I'm thinking about realism or about art in general. One of the things Courbet was known for was this saying, it is necessary to be of one's time. He wanted you to be involved in the real world as it is in the here and now, instead of becoming obsessed with the past, becoming overly, um, addicted to the ideas of depicting mythological stories or religious stories or stories from Greek and Roman history. He wanted art and life to be of the moment. He also said this, there's several different variations on this quote, but my favorite one is, I cannot paint an angel because I have never seen one. So he's not anti-religion. But what he's saying to you is that instead of making it up, instead of giving you a figure in a white robe with big fluffy wings, he's not going to paint anything until he can directly observe it with his own eyes. So this painting disturbed people when it was submitted for exhibition, uh, for the Exposition Universal. I think partial, part of the reason people didn't like it is because it is a little bit grim. It is a burial scene. It's a funeral at graveside. You can see in the very center at the bottom, you can see the open grave. And that is sort of our entry point to the painting. It's a little bit disturbing. This is the studio of the painter, a real allegory summarizing my seven years of life as an artist. It's a mouthful of title, but it is really kind of the quintessential Courbet piece for proving what it is that he's all about in terms of what realism means and how it's changing the world. You see him in the very center. He's painting a landscape. Beside him is a model, female. There's a male model behind the screen there, or behind the canvas, rather. They're both nude, so he clearly can do anatomical, proportionate work absolutely perfectly. He can paint the natural world. The whole setting is inside a room, so he can handle architecture, perspective. You have male and female figures. You have clothed figures and nudes. You have young and older. Yep animals. He is literally showing you that he can paint anything that he can see. But it's also a fascinating example in the way he has surrounded himself with other figures. These are people of the lower to middle classes on the left-hand side. 
his subjects. Notice that he's looking toward them. Behind him are people generally in the intelligentsia, the upper class or the elite class, who are his supporters, who are following him down this road toward making art about the here and now, art about the real world. In fact, we know the names of several of the people on the right-hand side, including Baudelaire. Baudelaire was a poet and an art critic. We'll see some other examples of people creating illustrations for his poems in later styles. But you can see how accurate, there's a photograph of Baudelaire and the painting really looks just like him. So Courbet is sticking to his rules for sure. He's not gonna paint anything except what he can see in exactly the way it looks to him. Daumier is a French painter who falls under the realist category. Obviously his image is less photographic. It is obviously hand drawn and painted, but he introduces what I would call social realism to the French uh, art world. And what he's painted here for us, this piece is called the third class carriage. What he's painted here is a glimpse into the life of working people in the 1800s. What we're seeing are people who are riding in the third class compartment in a train. They're on their way probably between work and going home. And you can see that there are people who are probably too old to be working, who are part of the group. That central female figure looks a bit elderly to be working. You can see a child who's probably too young to be working, but obviously is. There's a breastfeeding mother who's also a worker. But directly behind them, you notice that as poor as they look, there are two gentlemen in top hats who are clearly doing a little bit better financially, but who are perhaps saving a bit of money by riding in the third class carriage instead of the first, you get a feeling of how society has stratified, how people are keeping themselves in these social classes based on money and based on social status. So Daumier also revisited the subject more than once. This is the second version of it, which he made later and is um, heavily reworked, slightly altered from its original source. But you can see he's paying a little bit more attention to keeping the colors, highlights, and shadows more in the realist uh, mode. This is one of the pieces that I really admire of his. It is disturbing, but it is a remarkable piece of social criticism. This is a lithograph, a print that he made. We talked about lithography uh, earlier. Lithography is a printmaking process done on limestone. There's no carving or scraping. The image is drawn with a grease-like material. Whatever uh, touches the stone surface that has grease in it, even the oil in your skin, would start to, on a microscopic level, etch a little bit into the stone, creating little reservoir ink to stick to. So you can mass produce exact duplicates of this image by inking and printing from this piece of stone. And what you're seeing here would be one of the prints that he produced. Um, and then distributed, he got in trouble with the government for doing it because this piece is critical of police brutality. This is an event that actually took place in a lower income neighborhood. There was some kind of domestic dispute and somebody fired a gun, but the police, rather than investigating and trying to solve the crime or figure out who was behind it, started shooting their guns into the apartment building and they killed people who had nothing to do with the original crime at all. They killed babies, old people, young people, and that's precisely what Daumier is showing us here. The father collapsed on top of the dead body of the child beside his wife and one of their parents who clearly is dead as well. This is a shocking, shocking moment. Um, and his criticism of the government, of course, was met with censorship. The piece was uh, restricted, and in fact, the copies were destroyed. The stone itself was confiscated so that no new prints could be made. So you can see that the realists are not likely to just sit back and accept the way things have always been. They are doing their own uh, revolution in art and in social activism. Speaking of activism, this is the work of a female realist painter, Rosa Bonheur. This almost looks like a photograph when you first see it, especially the high contrast 
um, of the shadows and those furrows that they are plowing. This particular painting, if you zoom in on it, has even more detail the closer you get. You can practically see the veins in the eyes of the ox pulling the cart as it strains. You can certainly see the foam at its mouth. Notice that the human figure is a little less realistic than the ox. You don't notice it at, at first glance when you see the whole painting. It's a little more jarring when you see those two close together. One of the reasons for this is that as a woman, Rosa Benor was not allowed in the academy to draw or paint from the nude model. It was considered unseemly for women to have this access. So how is she going to learn how to do anatomy and proportion to make the images look as accurate as they can possibly be? We looked at art from the Middle Ages where people drew clothing and then added hands and heads sticking out of it, didn't look real, you have to understand the anatomy underneath to make the clothing look believable. So her solution to figuring out how to learn anatomical structure, this inner structure of a body, was to paint animals. So she did this throughout her career. In fact, she kept a menagerie of animals um, as pets herself, including some rather exotic animals. But Rosa Benur, in order to get access to these types of creatures, women in the uh, 1800s dressed in enormously long and rather heavy dresses uh, with bulky uh, width. It would have been almost impossible for her to wear the clothing that she was expected to wear in the environment of a farm or stockyard or other places where animals existed. So she had to find a way to work around that. To go to a place like the horse fair, she had to find a way of coping with the clothing issue, and we'll get to that in a moment. This is the horse fair, the piece to know for the test. It's her most famous example. Her uh, fame really was solidified by this piece, by the dynamic movement of it, by the fact that it showcases the um, accuracy of the style and the incredible amount of detail, but doesn't sacrifice speed or movement or the sense of immediacy that you get when you look at it. It feels as if those horses are really moving right in front of your eyes. We know that there have been replicas painted of it. She would have been um, encouraged to create more than one copy because of the fame the piece brought her. In fact, it was exhibited in London. Queen Victoria heard about it and asked for private viewing. So one of the most powerful female political leaders in the history of the world also supported the work of this uh, outstanding female French realist painter. One of the ways that Rosa Bonheur was able to create this level of realism was by literally having permission to dress in the clothing of the opposite gender. This is, if you translate it loosely into English, permission for being a transvestite. It's allowing her to wear the clothing of the opposite gender. This had to be approved by her doctor by the chief of police and she had to carry this document with her gang on just so that she would be able to wear pants so she'd be able to go into the stockyards into the farms and not be dragging us through all that mud and filth etc can you imagine the idea of having to have this legal document to control the type of clothing you wear shows you just one of the barriers that she was overcoming in her um, quest to be an artist. She became internationally famous. She was awarded the Legion of Honor in France. She also was lesbian, and we know that it was a fairly well-known um, relationship. She had two major relationships in her life. Her first wife died. Uh, her second lover was. Um, a bit younger than her, but also an artist in her own right. And it was somewhat known that they were a committed uh, romantic couple. So it's kind of remarkable to think about the fact that she was able to overcome all of these barriers to create the work that was her um, desire, that she wanted to create work that looked like the real world because she was so much a part of that real world, living on her own terms. Pretty amazing.